Bonjour à tous. Good morning to all of you. We are going to talk about globalization and positive economy. We've started to look at what was happening on the global energy market. And to start a discussion, when I heard about this for the first time, I was really appalled to see the differences between the world, the words, because globalization uh, for most people, I'm sure, refers to growth for the sake of growth, short-term vision. While positive economics should be about the long term, about regulations, and uh, I would like maybe to ask each and every one of you if you consider, just like I do, that there is a paradox here. Well, of course, there must be things that those two concepts have in common. We can get back to this in a minute, but what about the paradox first, Mr. Palti? Well, I don't see a paradox. And actually, it's uh, all the opposite. I think that globalization encourages positive economics. And maybe I'll have the opportunity to tell you more about that. Yes, uh, just for the sake of the discussion, let's look at this paradox. Globalization, as we consider it usually, is globalization of market. Now, globalization of markets without globalizing the state of law will create a market economy without a state of law. And a market economy without a state of law, even though it is the ideological dream of the economists in the 18th century, will generate only chaos. We've had some examples in global economy. And you see this with the European construction. They started with the market, and now they realize that just the market on its own is not enough. We need a state of law. And uh, just for property rights, if you have to have property rights, you need to have the police, you need to have the justice, etc. So while globalization is market globalization and that the um, a state of law is not globalized, it's chaos. The state of law can be democratic, a democratic world government. We would be aware of it if it was underway. But at least it should be um, globalization of the regulations. We're trying to do this in uh, Europe. And uh, it's not been a success, except maybe in some other areas where um, in some areas, the banking sector, for example, they've tried to implement a certain number of, of uh, world regulations. But without the rule of law, there's nothing that we can do. Oh, um, that's what you wanted to say to Mr. Barnier. Uh, regulations are not moving as fast as a certain number of the negative trends that you mentioned to us before. Yes, it's true in particular in, in the energy sector. Actually, we're not accusing the European Commission, but several European states for acting individually. And uh, if there is one area where it should not be the case, it's energy. And uh, I'm talking in particular about uh, global warming. The um, IPCC just uh, recalled yesterday how um, alarming the situation is. CO2 is what is uh, discharged in the atmosphere. And it's not something that just uh, uh, remains uh, as a little cloud over one country. Like, for example, it would be useless for Luxembourg, for example, to become a country that would discharge no CO2 if all the other surrounding countries continued to um, increase their CO2 emissions. And what holds true for Luxembourg inside of Europe also holds true for Europe inside the rest of the world. So there is uh, interdependence here in those issues. And uh, I think that positive economics and globalization uh, should not be opposed and are not in opposition. And this is what we've seen here during those two days. Positive economics is opening up to the world, it's uh, sharing cultures, taking into account other people's interests, taking into account the uh, interests and benefits of everybody's, uh, of everybody on the planet, every inhabitant of the planet. This long-term approach, thinking about the future generations, is something that is natural and that we cannot do away with. Well, I'm, I'm back to Mr. Palti because this is where you started off. You work in a group which is uh, in contact with uh, um, the uh, 
retail distribution, mass distribution, which is not the paragon of positive economics, usually not in the minds of the people anyway. And I'm sure that some examples have shown that uh, sometimes there is a, a model that is deployed globally of uh, purchasing the cheapest products without looking at anything else and without caring for um, solidarity or uh, interdependence. And you said that there was no paradox. So how about this? Where's the complementarity here in consumer goods and mass distribution? I'm not a distributor, right? I, I want to make this clear. I provide services to retail in general. And what I see is that there is a movement, an underlying movement, uh, which is present everywhere in the world today, and uh, people want things which are more humane, more social, they need to see better consumption. And this is where I make the connection with retail at large. That is, as Gérard Mestralet said, consumers are becoming players in all economic systems. You see an increase of what we call consum action. And uh, um, that is consumers, we know that they're citizens, and they've been, they, they, they've, they've taken the power over their consumption. They even have the power to boycott or to ban a product when they consider that it's not the, the right product. So we feel that this is really increasing, and these consumer actors uh, have become more clever uh, than the uh, retailers that sell products to them. So for the retail industry, uh, of course, there's been some awareness, which very often has come from the bottom, just like it's, uh, it happens in companies. I think that in companies, employees are far ahead on their leaders. And in some countries, the citizens are ahead of the country leaders when looking for a meaning and for a better world. So uh, retail uh, enterprises, the largest ones anyway, the ones which are the most global, globalized, have decided to also become players to provide better consumption for the people in order to contribute to a better world for tomorrow. This is what we've seen today. Maybe it's a very strong trend. What could this be in 20 years? What could this look like in 20 years? You know, now consumers know how to adjust their behaviors uh, based on their beliefs and uh, based on, on what happens, you know, We've seen what happened after the fire of that textile plant in Bangladesh and the global impact that this had on consumption. So, Jacques Attali, you've worked a lot on information networks. And what do you think, how far do you think this could go in 20 years? Because we feel that we already have a lot of information. Well, in 20 years from now, well, first of all, there's a big turn that is ahead of us. I've said this before, I'm going to say it differently. Let's go back one century, September 1913. We were uh, having exactly the same discussions as today. And they knew at the time that global integration had started, was a major trend, and that they needed international rules. And then there was August 14, and then there was the war, uh, fascism, the Nazis, the Second World War, uh, World War, etc. So why am I saying this? Because. At some point, when you see the need for a global order, you might have a, a crisis with a lot of nationalism, uh, ethnicism, um, xenophobia, and everybody would, would shut themselves down, would close themselves up on themselves. And so, and actually, in 1913, those countries came to war where they had absolutely no reason to go to war. There was such a, 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 a large economic integration between uh, England and Germany that this level of integration was only achieved again last year. So economic integration is not an obstacle. So the first struggle is against um, a, a, a clash. But let's say that we managed to 
win this battle and that everybody understands that it is in our interest that other people are happy and uh, in good health because if we decide that we cannot buy t-shirts uh, made by children, then there will be progressive integration. The texts are there. This is fascinating because you're not supposed, you could not be a member of the uh, WTO if you do not apply the uh, uh, ILO uh, texts and regulations. So it, it's there, it's, it's in the text, but it's absolutely not enforced. And uh, so far we have no means to enforce it. This is what we should be doing. I think we could do it because 100% of consumers are voters, but only 50% of voters are workers. So there is the uh, tyranny of consumers over producers. And if consumers are not educated, well, what they want is the lowest possible price, low cost. Even if in developed countries, it's the rule. That's what everybody goes by. So consumers have to be aware that low cost is suicidal. And so, of course, it's better if uh, there is sustainability here. And I must say it's not the trend. The trend right now is the total domination of low cost because we are in this period of time where people have no purchasing power. Purchasing power is not increasing. The only growth in purchasing power would be through a drop in prices, deflation. So reduction of so the social protection of those people who produce the goods. So we need to give power back to the producers so, so that everybody realizes that they're both consumers and producers. And uh, I'm not talking about something that should be made in France. You know, but I want decent production conditions so that the system can work and operate. This is why I think uh, our movement is important. We need to understand that we are all um, uh, in several dimensions, and maybe in a few years from now we could have an ideal world that would just enforce the existing texts and regulations. You could not be a member of WTO if you do not apply the rules of ILO. International Labour Office. Now, what you said about the connection between consumers and uh, producers, different ways of producing energy that could actually engage consumers. How did you view the evolution of such behavior? As Jacques Attili said, we have this tyranny of low cost, total domination. So, what, what, what do you think about this evolution? Well, I think uh, you can actually call it a revolution. Uh, and in the area of energy, it's been quite recent. The reason is technologies, new technologies to produce power by small units. You know, for the past 50 years, the trend was power plants, nuclear power plants that were becoming bigger and bigger. And then, all of a sudden, uh, you had these small power production units, micro uh, generation plants that could actually be used at the scale of the consumers themselves. And then you've had the introduction of digital technologies, and there was this convergence between the digital systems and energy generation. And this technical revolution enabled consumers to um, become empowered. And um, there was an awareness of the damage that uh, energy generation had produced because it was the, 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 the main CO2 producer. And so all this put together created a new paradigm, a new relationship between individuals and energy consumption. And the idea was that the people wanted to be able to make their own decisions, to decide where their energy would come from, to decide to uh, manage their own energy inside their homes. And this is where the digital world comes into play, because you've got all those instruments uh, which uh, enable you to have a smart home. You know, you've got those sensors everywhere in the home to help you optimize your uh, heat and power consumption, to help you decide whenever you should start the heat system and uh, what time you should start them, because you want to be able to consume electricity when it's cheaper 
and, and there's this problem of um, all this power that is produced when there's a lot of wind, for example, by the wind uh, turbine. And consumers want to become producers, but there are different ways of becoming producers. You can be a producer by actually balancing your consumption uh, with what you're producing yourself. So I don't know exactly what the uh, energy picture will look like in the future, but as a company, of course, this is something that we're looking at. And at GDF Suez, uh, in order to try to get everybody to think about what this will be like tomorrow, we've asked our top managers, branch and division managers, to try to analyze the situation and to imagine what this new activity will be like, because for them it's a, it's a shift in their business model. But I've also asked uh, young people to work on this. I've taken about 100 of them who have to interview 10 people in the company, so that we're going to have a total of 1,000 persons. And we also have a women's network in the company, which is called Women in Network. And we've decided also to ask them how they uh, view the future of our activities from their point of view as uh, employees in that industry and as consumers, because uh, this is going to be a system that is going to take different, several different forms and shapes, and so we can't really define now what it's going to be like in 20 years. Well, in the past, it was... Very similar in every country, you had basically a monopoly that would decide everything. Yes, it's difficult to forecast innovation, but basically there are breakthrough. There are a, a few breakthrough innovations that create a shift now. But of course, um, one of the recommendations in um, Jacques Attali's commission was about displaying uh, the social and environmental impact on the products, on the price tag. This hasn't been done yet. So, uh, Mr. Palti, once again, you're not a retailer, but you're in contact with the retailers and mass distribution companies. So what do you think about this? Do you think that this display Alors, could have an impact? Oui, sûr, well, yes, of course. Sur, uh, sur de low but cost I'd like to get Jack. back to this idea uh, of oui, low cost that Jack was talking about. Yes, of course, today temps, there is a trend. But still, I'm a little bit more optimistic très, très than he is. En mais venu aussi de la santé de I see that there is this de health and nutrition concern now uh, uh, that on, it might actually change things. You know, we see what's happening in Europe and in the US regarding traceability of products, and uh, people want to know where they come from, how they were made, and of course they're looking at the nutritional value. It's something that's actually started in China. You know that the richest Chinese are uh, migrating just because they want their kids to be properly fed, to eat properly. So you know that in China you have uh, 30 to 50,000 social conflicts, i.e. Strikes per year, that is about 50 every day. So uh, now that we have a globalized world, a borderless world, we really have a ramping up of the search for better nutrition, better consumption, and I'm very optimistic uh, because I think that this is really going to change things. It's going to go beyond borders, beyond corporations, beyond governments. But still, the crisis is here and uh, people tend to uh, work more um, or to buy more on a budget, but I'm thinking that still they will try to buy better quality products. Oh, yes, absolutely. There are heavy trends, which we've seen. But there is such a high number of poor populations that if they can't produce at a low cost in China, well, then they'll go to Vietnam or to Ethiopia. We have such a potential for low cost production 
that uh, we're not about to see the end of it yet. But I think that traceability is key. In Planet Finance, and Raphael came with me to see this with a few others, we've started to set up a certain number of activities in order to improve the um, consideration of the poorest producers in the chain of value, to make sure that the poorest producers could actually have access to profit by getting rid of a certain number of intermediaries. And I think that for producers, it's good to be able to sell the product and to be able to tell the story to the consumers. And for consumers, it's also good. So we have a lot of companies which are coming to us now and they say, help us find good producers and tell us the story of what those producers are doing from the raw material to the finished good. And in a lot of countries, we're helping producers, of example, shea butter or um, all kinds of things. And we are helping them to make sure that the final um, user, final buyer, can actually uh, hear the story of this little producer. Now, is this going to stay something for uh, the rich and for an elite, or is this going to become something ethical? You know, in French, we have this word bobo, which is a little bit uh, um, uh, negative, but... Uh, uh, Usually these people have a vision, so uh, we need, but I think that we need laws to enforce this, otherwise it's not going to stay. Oh, you were talking about France. We have not talked a lot about the state, which we usually do in France. Oh, I really have to say something here about those bobo people. Yes, we all know what's happening in San Francisco uh, with these people, what's happening uh, uh, with the locavores, basically. You're supposed to consume stuff that's being produced less than 200 kilometers from your home, so you buy directly from producers or you're a producer. Why don't you go and see them? They're just across the, the hall here. You've got local producers from around here, so please go and buy products from them, local. So this could, would sound like it's bobo. Like it's a little bit of this new bourgeois thing. But yesterday, when I came here, I stopped in front of a certain number of shops and I saw that there were a lot of regional products. And I, and I do think that French people are locavores, actually, because very early they've started to consume stuff that was coming from close to where they live. If you look at the, uh, even in the supermarkets, you do have offers in all um, retail brands, Leclerc, Carrefour, Intermarché, Auchan, they do offer local produce. I think it's coming, and it's coming fast. Well, if we want to summarize, uh, we've uh, looked at a certain number of things that would actually counter globalization. We've talked about the changes in consumers' minds. We've talked about uh, how consumers could influence the uh, market. We've talked about technological innovation that could make consumers into producers. We won't have time, but you talked about public <coughs> procurement, of course, in France. We always want to talk about the state. Well, you've, you've touched upon that slightly. So uh, this is also one of your recommendations in your report. So I'm sure it has been or will be debated even more. I really want to thank you for being with us, Mr. Mestralia, Mr. Um, Atalia, Mr. Palti. Thank you very much. And I think we will now hand over to the next speakers for another different session.